we want to talk about leadership in the context of this crazy year we've had. And when I think about leading um, in this quarantine, lockdown, COVID world we're in, when nobody really knows what's going to happen next week or next month, because it seems like in different places around the world, things have opened up and then closed down and then opened up and then closed down. And, and so um, the, the mechanism of leading congregations uh, keeps changing, it seems like. When I think about our world, I'm reminded of the Apostle Paul and how he led from prison. Where he was leading the people and what he was doing as a leader didn't change. The substance of it didn't change. The calling didn't change. What changed is Paul had to figure out how to do the things that he would prefer to do face to face. He had to do it through letters. He had to figure out how to do things that he would prefer to do himself. And then he had to delegate those to Timothy or Titus or others. The leadership functions were still happening. The leadership principles, the leadership uh, outcome, the leadership direction, the leadership foundation, it was all still the same. It was simply how it played out. And so I think when people talk about the new normal, I think sometimes we push that maybe to an extreme degree because I think the foundations and the boundaries and the outcomes don't change. What we're talking about the same way we're doing this conference now, where we're not face to face, but we have to figure out how to accomplish what we needed to accomplish anyway. And I want you to think about that in the context of leading and in the context of multiplying leaders. And I want to look today at Psalm 78. It's a long psalm, but we're going to look at the conclusion. And in this psalm, Asaph has narrated the ups and downs of Israel's history. And it's like a, it's like their Hundreds of years of history packed in just a few minutes. But then the conclusion is what we want to look at because it builds up to David, who was one of the greatest leaders that Israel ever had. Not a perfect leader. He had all kinds of uh, failings and fallings and, and sins and faults. But yet, overall, there was great leadership. And we want, we want to look at that. Beginning in verse 70, he chose David, his servant, and took him from the sheepfolds, from following the nursing ewes, he brought him to shepherd Jacob, his people, Israel, his inheritance. With upright heart, he shepherded them and guided them with his skillful hands. In these three verses, we see the unchangeable parts of leadership. We see the part that even though the world is topsy-turvy and unpredictable now, there are leadership principles and leadership foundations that don't change. And the first one we find in verse 70. And here it is. Leadership is a calling, not a career. Leadership is a calling, not a career. It starts with this phrase, he chose David. God chose David. David didn't choose himself for this. David didn't aspire to this. Um, when I think about David, it talks about he chose him from this shepherding moment. If, if we can go back to 1 Samuel 16, you all know the story. Um, God's finished with Saul, and the word of the Lord comes to Samuel the prophet. And he says, go to Jesse, because the next king is going to be one of Jesse's sons. So here goes Samuel. He tells Jesse to line up his sons. And the first one who walks across of the seven sons that Jesse brings out, the first one, Samuel looks at him, looks at his stature, looks at his confidence. Uh, I don't know what he saw in him, but he says, that's got to be the one. That's the anointed one. The Lord says, no, not him. The next one, the next one, the next one. And each one, Samuel's thinking, okay, that's, that's the one. And each time the Lord says, no, seven times. And so now, Samuel has heard from God that one of Jesse's sons will be the next king. And so he looks at Jesse and says, is this it? Do you have any other sons? He goes, well, I've got one more, the youngest. Um, he's out, in the, out on the field watching the sheep, and he's probably knowing him. He's probably writing poetry and singing songs and slinging rocks. And then here comes David. And the moment David walks in, as soon as Samuel sees him, Scripture tells us the word of the Lord came. 
And the Lord spoke and said, that's the one. And so Samuel responds to that, anoints him, and then the scripture tells us the Spirit of God came on David. Now, no one saw any leadership potential in David. No one. Those closest to him didn't, it wasn't even an afterthought to bring David to the lineup. It wasn't a thought at all. When Samuel tells Jesse, the Lord has told me one of your sons will be the next king, but I don't know which one will you get your sons. He gets them all except David. His dad doesn't even believe in him. His brothers don't see anything in him. Just you just stay here and watch the sheep and play your childish games and we'll go figure out who the next king is. So often calling is like that. Sometimes a calling seems obvious, but often it doesn't. So many times the call of God is a curveball. It's a surprise to many people. But we've got to understand that leadership starts with a call. As you're developing leaders, if there's not a call of God on their life, if there's not a hand of God on their life, you're wasting your time. If someone has this ministry calling, then work with them and train them and develop and empower and equip and and everything you can do. But if their calling is to do something else and there's not the grace of God to do this, but there is the grace of God to do something else, then you're wasting your time trying to develop someone to do something God hasn't called them to do. They might actually end up doing it and doing it seemingly successfully, but it'll be the work of man rather than the work of God. And so when we think about leadership and we think about leadership multiplication and we think about leadership development, remember, leadership is a calling, not a career. If it's a career, then we start with a conversation about salary packages, about benefits packages, about retirement, about titles and positions. If it's a calling, then we need to be concerned about two things. The purpose for which we're called. What is the purpose? Secondly, the place that we're called. Calling always has to do with a place. Eugene Peterson writing in this the classic book, uh, Christ Plays in 10,000 Places, in com- his commentary on Genesis, he talks about when we divorce theology from geography, we get trouble. And he, he starts using this phrase, the gift of place, and that every calling has a place, a geographical place. I look at the places where God called me. There was a season when I was called to Starkville, Mississippi, a tiny little college town. From there, I was called to Manila, Philippines uh, for more than two decades. In the last 12 years, the calling has based me primarily in Nashville, Tennessee. I wouldn't have picked any one of those places, but I am so glad God picked them. And looking back, it makes sense. Each stop along the way, each place that had to do with God's call in my life. And so when we think about leadership as a calling, it starts with God, it ends with God, the middle has to be God. We're just partnering with God to help a person, a man or a woman, become what God's called them to be and to do. We're not trying to get them to do something we want. It's figuring out what is God's call. Maybe like David, nobody sees any potential, but God has a calling. But that calling always has a purpose. Paul's purpose didn't change because he was in prison. He just had to figure out better and new and creative ways to fulfill that purpose. The COVID lockdowns and quarantines haven't changed the purpose to which any of us are called. We just have to figure out new ways to fulfill that purpose God's called us to. And there's always the place. The second point is this. It's not just that leadership is a calling, not a cause, but leadership is about people, not about policies. I appreciate policies as organizations grow. They're essential. I was in a conversation last night with our Real Life Foundation board. Our Real Life Foundation in the Philippines, we have over 900 scholars where we take care of their tuition and books and everything related to their education. And it's amazing to watch deserving 
intelligent, disciplined, uh, high achieving people, but they're just too poor to afford education. And they, they, they can't get out of poverty because of no access to good education. And watching those real life scholars, not only coming out of poverty, but pulling their families one by one out of poverty. So we had a board meeting last night on a Zoom call. And we were talking about our policies of the academic standards our scholars have to keep up or they can't be a part of the program. We talked about our ethical and moral standards to be a part of our scholarship program. And unfortunately, there were a few of the scholars who were put on probation or removed. But our discussion as a board was, okay, we have the policies, but let's think about that individual. Let's think about those people. Because ultimately what we're about is getting quality education to marginalized people so their family can be pulled out of, out of poverty. And, and, and the, it was refreshing to see the whole board, while we do have good policies and they're important, ultimately we see that our leadership in that role is primarily about the people. The policies help, but we wanna put the people above the policy when necessary and when applicable and it was, it was a good discussion uh, about that, that. And so when we look at David, when we look at David right here, it says he started out, God chose him, and he was with the sheep. And, and we don't, maybe nobody listening to this message is working with sheep. Maybe it's, maybe it's computers. Maybe it's spreadsheets. Uh, maybe it's um, sales. Maybe it's politics or journalism or whatever. There is some kind of something we're doing that God calls us from. And it says in verse 71, he called him from following the nursing ewes. That's, that's the small lamb. He brought him to shepherd his people. Leadership ultimately is not about leading a department, a church, an organization, a, a, anything else we lead. It's really the people. Organizational leadership Knowledge is important, but only to the degree that it helps us lead people. If you're leading a church, that church is the people of God. If you're leading a campus ministry, you're leading people. Yeah, you have to interact with the rules of the campus, but even that you're interacting with people, not with policies and not with principles, but people. Leadership is about people. God in this text took David from the sheep God chose him when nobody else would choose him. And that's many of us as leaders. Nobody else would have picked us. God chose him when nobody else would. And then he brought him from this career path into a place of leading people. But remember that word, it says his people. Remember, they're not your people. If you're a pastor, if you're a campus ministry, if you're a department head leader, if you're a business owner watching this message, those aren't your people. They're his people ultimately. And how we treat something that is another's tells a lot about us. And it actually becomes a means and a mechanism whereby we will either be promoted or not, uh, according to what Jesus said in Luke 16. Okay, so now that we've established that leadership is a calling, not primarily a career. Leadership is about people, not primarily about the policies. Then we get to verse 72. The next Big idea about leadership here, whether it's applied to us as leaders or the leaders we're trying to develop and equip and empower. Verse 72, with upright heart, he shepherded them. So leadership requires an upright heart. Leadership is beyond the title, the position, the things we do, as always with scripture, as always with spirituality. It goes past the surface into the heart. In fact, even in that passage we looked at in Samuel, uh, when he looked at the older brother Eliab and said, that's got to be the one. The word of the Lord came that God looks at the heart. Humans look at the outside and we evaluate, okay, that's a potential leader, that's not. But God doesn't. He looks at the heart. And what he's looking for, it tells us right here, an upright heart. There was something about the heart of David that God knew that Samuel and no one else around David saw. Because God looks at the heart, we tend to look at the outside. And so as we're developing leaders, as much as our tendency, the human tendency is to look at the outside, we've got to somehow be able to see the invisible, which is the heart.
We've got to go past the externals and work on the heart. And what we're doing is working toward hearts that are upright. Um, the scripture tells us in Proverbs chapter 17, verse 3, that the same way a crucible is for silver, the Lord tests the heart. Now, what does it mean, a crucible for silver? A crucible was a, a ceramic pot where they heated it up where the silver would melt. The heat would cause the silver to melt. And as it melted and became liquid, the impurities would rise up. They could be scraped off. And then now we have pure or more pure silver. The same way the heat exposes the impurities in silver, so God tests the hearts of his people. And it's the fire, it's the pressure, it's the heat, it's the uncomfortable, unpredictable circumstances that we would never choose for ourselves. Those pressure moments cause the impurities to come to the surface so that eventually those are scraped off and we have these upright hearts. God will test the hearts. I think about Genesis 22, 1, and I call this a lordship test. The verse says, the very first verse in chapter 22, God tested Abram. And he tested him by taking the most important thing to him and calling for a sacrifice. And sacrificial obedience to God is a heart test. And it gets the impurities out and it deals with stuff at a deep level, not a surface level. So if leadership is primarily a calling from God, leadership is about people, that kind of leadership requires an upright heart. And then finally it says, David guided them in verse 72 with skillful hands. There are a lot of people who have a calling, a lot of people who love people, and they've got a good heart, but unfortunately they haven't developed the skills necessary to be good leaders. And really that's where we are with a lot of people we're trying to develop. God's the one who tests the heart. I can't change someone's heart but God can. But what I can do and what you can do with the leaders you're developing is to help them identify and upgrade the skills they need. When we think about the highest level of leadership, I wanna just mention three skills that we always need to upgrade and we always need to work on. The first one is vision casting. Because we lead people, we, the primary thing people will follow is a visionary leader. And so the better we get at casting the vision before people, the more we can lead those people. So always upgrade vision casting skills. And some simple aspects of that is the vision has to be simple and concise and clear and written. The vision has to be repeated over and over and over. You go read Habakkuk where he talks about the vision is being cast and clarified and simplified so that people can run with it. Not just so we can post it on the wall or run it through social media, but so people can act on it. So vision casting, that's a skill. Secondly, critical thinking. There are too many leaders who are just cut and paste leaders. They just borrow ideas and cut and paste from other people. But when it comes down to it, they can't think critically about that idea. They can't critically dissect that idea and push aside the parts that aren't applicable and run with those that are. Critical thinking has to do with not only creative thinking, but also independent thinking. It has to do with wisdom thinking, with going beyond the surface down to the heart of the idea. And if there's anything that leaders need to work on, critical thinking is at the top of that list. And the third skill I wanna talk about that can be and must be developed uh, for leaders to become everything God's called them to be, provided they have a calling and provided they love people and provided they have the upright heart. That other skill is the idea of culture building. Culture is built by our example, Culture is built by our words. Culture is built by history. Culture is built by repetition. Culture is built by the things that we do, the things that we celebrate, the things that we print, the things that we promote, the things that we fund. There's so much that goes into building the right culture. We can have all the right principles and a great strategic plan and all of these things going, but if we don't have a good culture, we won't have a good team. We won't be able to sustain what we're doing. So 
Let me give you this final thought as we look at the life of David here in Psalm 78. We look at this up and down history that culminates in Asaph writing in Psalm 78, but after all that, God chose David. God called David. God took him out of the sheep into this place of leading people, not just sheep. And then God formed this upright heart and these skilled hands. And of course, you see the ups and downs of David's life, but you see ultimately where he led and what the nation became. But as you lead and as you develop leaders around you, leaders that maybe no one sees the potential apart from you. You see it, but nobody else sees it. And they're scratching their heads wondering why you would ever empower that person. I want to give you an idea to think about your church and your ministry. Think about it as a runway, a leadership runway. When you get to a runway, there are basically two things that happen on a runway. Planes land and planes take off. That's pretty much it. That's the purpose of a runway. Some runways are long because giant jets are landing on those runways. Others are short because small planes are landing on those. We want to create the kind of culture, the kind of atmosphere where leaders are taking off. Whether they're 747 leaders or whether they're small propeller planes, but leaders are constantly taking off. We're not trying to hold them back. We're trying to create the culture where leaders are taking off into their calling. And it may be in a place away from here. We may train in this place, but God calls him in that place. Selfishness will hold on. But this kind of leadership we're talking about will let them go where God's called them, the place God's put them. But we're also creating a runway where people can land. In your ministries, your churches, in your world, there will be people landing because they've been out there for a while. They need to refuel. They need to retool. Some of them are landing for good. They need to retire. But whatever the case, we want to create a safe landing strip. At the same time some are landing, others are taking off. It's the leadership runway we're looking at. But remember, it starts with a call, a call from God. I am grateful for every leader watching this, how you've responded so often sacrificially to the call of God. And I pray that God will use you and your experience and your gifts to equip and empower and multiply leaders all over your context, all over the nation, to the nations.